Final scripture reading is from Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. Let's open our hearts to what the Spirit is speaking today through these words. Just as you do not know how the breath comes to the bones in the mother's womb, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening do not let your hands be idle, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. And even those who live many years should rejoice in all of them. Yet let them remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, young man, while you are young, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Follow the inclination of your heart and the desire of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Banish anxiety from your mind and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, grant us understanding, not just of the words we read today and hear, the words that will take shape in our hearts, but understanding for how you move and live in this world. Understanding for what it means that Christ gives his body and blood for us. An understanding of what it means to be called children of God, sent into the world to be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. God, today, give us understanding that is not passive and sits back, but understanding that calls us into life with you and for you, with our neighbor and for them. In Jesus' name, amen. So this might spoil it for you all, but I hope that throughout this sermon, I might argue or show that that scripture in Ecclesiastes says kind of negatively what Paul McCartney says positively, what Jesus teaches as wisdom on the Sermon on the Mount. Did you catch all that? On face level, the three messages of Solomon, of Paul, and of Jesus, not the Paul, the St. Paul, but Paul McCartney, might seem detached. They might seem not quite linked up, but I see the struggle of their words as deeply linked because each of them is tackling a core part of our human experience of our lives. With a quick show of hands, and you're not in trouble, how many people here have read the book of Ecclesiastes from start to finish, and not just the chapter 3, there is a time for every season, you know, the birds? We've got a couple. It is, it is not an easy read, but I do recommend it, especially on a rainy day. And we believe this book to be a collection of wisdom sayings that are attributed to King Solomon, David's son, who was known to be wise, who was successful, who was wealthy, and who also had flaws. Ecclesiastes is the perfect reading for someone going through a midlife crisis. The book starts with this wonderful inspirational quote, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from their toil under the sun? It's really uplifting, right? Some people translate that, that we are chasing, he says we're chasing after the wind. Some people translate it to say, we chase after vapor. We are vapor. It doesn't get much more uplifting. At one point, our wisdom tells us that we're vapor, that we're dust in the wind. And Ecclesiastes comes across as the ramblings of someone who is struggling just to see the point of it all. It's actually, um, it's actually a very relatable biblical book, especially if you're someone who at any point in life has asked, what is the point? Or, I'm too old for this. You've got a friend in Solomon and Ecclesiastes, if you've ever felt those emotions. So after Solomon has imparted all this jaded wisdom to us, we come to our reading today. The pinnacle of his advice for young people embarking on this thing that we call life. The, the moment where he wants to impart wisdom to those who need wisdom. And it would be easy for us to sum up his lesson as this. Rejoice while you're young and enjoy your youth while you've got it. 
And I wonder if anyone has ever said these words to someone they were trying to impart wisdom to. They would make sense coming from someone who has lived a long life full of good and bad and difficult and indifferent. But what if there's something far more beautiful? What if Solomon has realized in all of his ruling and all of his acquiring and all of his leading that he failed to recognize in all those moments in his past the latent mystery of God working around him? The mystery of God that grows out of the smallest moments of life, the smallest elements, the glorious mystery of those moments of peace and joy that we can so easily overlook as we race to grind and achieve and accomplish. Life is fleeting. Don't let the mystery of it all pass you by while you're setting your next plan. In Ecclesiastes, I hear a man who has no reason to complain complaining that his eyes were not open soon enough to the wonder that surrounded him all this time. Perhaps this moment of confusion for Solomon was on Jesus' mind during the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, Look at the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, but they are better clothed than Solomon in all his glory. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann suggests that Jesus was actually kind of taking a dig at Solomon at this point. Solomon is is actually kind of a, 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 a complex figure in Israel history. He was this wise king, this accomplished king. He built the temple for God, but he also sometimes let his ambition get in the way of what was right. He used unethical means of labor to build that temple at times. He acquired wealth for himself. He used marriage as a way to get ahead in the world to the point where he he got kind of trapped in his own relationships. Solomon was known as a complex king in in the history of Israel. And we might read it this way, that Jesus is saying, Look at the lilies of the field. They just grow. They simply be themselves, and they are more lovely than Solomon, the wise, the wealthy, the powerful king. These transient flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow display the full glory of God in ways that Solomon's vying and his accomplishments could not. You see, Solomon was not the perfect king. Perhaps Jesus is using him as a cautionary tale. Don't let your ambition stop you from seeing the beauty and glory of God already working here and now through and with you. Isn't that the real danger in always looking ahead and always planning and always trying to get to the next step in life? We're so caught up in what we will make that we fail to see the good work in and front of us. Do not worry about tomorrow, Jesus ends this with. Today's trouble is enough. Or perhaps, do not consume yourself worrying about the empire you're building. Today has wonderful tasks of its own. Today is full of God's mystery, so don't overlook it. So the story behind our song today, Let It Be, begins in 1968, two years before the album would come out. And Paul McCartney had a dream one night in 1968 during, after a really intense recording session with the Beatles during their White Album. I imagine there was some arguing. This was at the point when the band was beginning to fray a little bit. And in this dream, Paul's mother, Mary, his actual mother, Mary McCartney, not, not Mary um, you know, the mother of Jesus, though when asked, he he leaves it open to interpretation. But in this dream, Paul's mother, Mary, who had died of cancer when he was 14, who he missed terribly, came to him and repeated the words, let it be, it will be all right, let it be. And that was the birth of this song, this dream in the midst of this tumultuous time. Now, Paul McCartney had grown up in England. He was born at the in the middle of World War II for England's involvement. He had, by 1970, climbed out of the, what he would call the lower rung of the working class into the upper stratospheres as a musician. What did Paul need to let it be? What was hurting him at that moment? He was a millionaire. When he wrote this song, he was one of the most famous people in history. I can only speculate as what the question to Mary's answer was. What was the question that Paul was asking that night in his sleep? To hear, let it be, it will be okay. 
He had all the money he ever wanted. He had a job that many of us would aspire to have. And at the time of the dream, he had met the love of his life, Linda McCartney. So what did Paul need to let be? And I'm going to venture a guess, which is hazardous, so I appreciate any counter offers on this guess. But I wonder if in those tense last years of the Beatles, Paul felt the magnificent shift that was coming for him. What would he be without this band that had made him who he was? What was the course of his life without the band that he had spent 10 years plus building into this spectacular group? What was Paul McCartney without Ringo and George and John? Who was he? I wonder if he was beginning to have this moment of crisis. What will I be when this is all over? There are plenty of people in high positions of popularity and power, athletes, musicians, who once they move on to the next thing, struggle to know what's next. What if the words that Paul heard that night in his sleep are not simply an invitation to do nothing, to just sit back, to let it lay there, though that can be a valid form of wisdom too? What if it was an echo of Solomon and Jesus' call to pause in that moment and to understand the mystery and grace of God that sits in each moment? The mystery and grace of God that is in our highest moments and in our lowest moments, and in the moments where we're in between, that we are called to recognize and participate in this unfolding mystery. Do not worry what you will be or what you will become. Instead, grow in now. Grow in God's potential grace that is there right now for you. What if our lives... We're not so much about striving for the next thing, but about honoring God's presence in the moment. Granted, we should plan. I'm a planner. I'm a person who likes to have everything in line. I like to, I like to have everything planned out. You can um, ask Jenny if something throws off my schedule for one day. I tend to get in a funk. But what if instead of letting that mess me up for the rest of the day, what if I paused for a moment to say, God, what are you doing in this moment that I don't have planned? God, where is your grace rising up from this moment that I can't predict? What if that was the place of the church, that in each moment we believed in the latent possibilities of God's presence and grace? That if every setback was an opportunity to lean further in to Christ, to worry about the moment, but not worry in the sense of to be in despair, but to worry in the sense of to worry about how are we going to see God in this moment? What if the next hour, the next day was how am I going to see God in this moment instead of what am I going to accomplish today? Communion was an invitation to that. In the midst of a very tense moment, Jesus is about to go to the grave and die, and his disciples are worried they begin to ask questions. They, be, they deny that this will happen. They deny that they will be too scared and run away. And in that moment, with the weight of the Roman Empire and of all those who denied Jesus on his shoulders, Jesus pauses and brings these very simple things, bread and juice, and he says, join me in this divine mystery. Remember my body and blood and become the loving body of Christ. He doesn't say it exactly that way, but we've pulled that from his words to serve your neighbor, to love as he is loved, and to know that he is with us until the end of the age. Communion is where we come in this congregation monthly to be reminded that the mystery of God pervades even the smallest things if we will only pause and celebrate it. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room. And while they were worrying about what would come tomorrow, he wanted them to be present with him in that moment. In the moment when he washed their feet, in the moment when he taught them, and in the moment when he instituted this supper, this celebration of all that Christ is. So with his disciples, he took the bread. He blessed it. In the same way, at the end of the supper, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, and 
poured it out and said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you and for me, for the forgiveness of sins. And he reminded us that every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so in remembrance of the life and death and resurrection of Christ that calls us into its life. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out your presence on these gifts of bread and juice. You would let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. God, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one with ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Holy Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.